morning. Welcome to Commonplace Church. We're going to sing some songs, worship Jesus together. Feel free to join us.
you guys take a few minutes, say hello to somebody around you, and then uh, go ahead and take a seat. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Commonplace Church. That was warm. Wow, that was hot. I'm so sorry. Uh, this is Commonplace Church. We exist to glorify God, equip disciples, and share the good news of Jesus. My name is Corey. This is Talia. What's up, Talia? Hey. Hey. <laughs> we have some announcements for you, and then we'll keep on doing what we do here. Yeah. So um, we have youth group today. First regular meeting in a little while, so our middle schoolers will be meeting directly after service, and high schoolers will be meeting at Ledgewood Baptist Church tonight at 6.30. So be sure to come join us for those. And very exciting, next week we have our youth group worship night. We'll be going to Ledgewood Baptist Church, no, Mount Olive Community Bible Church, the other one, right down the road. Um, so many places we go to. When you don't have your own church building, you use a lot of other people's and, church buildings. Geez. So we're going to Mount Olive Community Bible Church right down the road next week, youth group. We're going to have a, a worship night. It's going to be really fun. So 6.30 next week, mark your calendars. Yeah, really looking forward to that. So that's for all of our uh, students and leaders. If you're at all interested in serving with our youth group, we definitely invite you to come to that event. Just come check it out as well. Get a feel for what we got going on. 
Um, so really everybody is invited. It's for the students, but if you're interested in potentially serving with our youth group, feel free to come on by as well. Uh, something else we have going on as a church is last week we started our season of Lent. And for Lent, really what we're doing is just laying aside the weight of life, the things that hold us back from pursuing God, from our relationship with God, the things that distract us, the things that consume us. And so some practices that we're trying to roll out to help us um, to really seek God is, uh, there are a few different things. There's generosity. We have uh, the option to uh, donate to Benny's Bodega through clothing donations or uh, the Mount Olive Food Pantry through food donations. We have uh, collection boxes that we'll have in the lobby every week. Uh, speaking of which, um, on the other hand, generosity, uh, Loretta actually put out uh, free children's books. So you'll see those on the way out. Please feel free to grab one uh, so we can be generous both ways. Um, another thing that we have going on is fasting on Mondays, prayer every Wednesday, which we've been doing on Zoom from 7 to 8 p.m. So feel free to join us for that. And then Saturday is just a uh, time of solitude to kind of stop. We do a lot of things for God. And one thing we want to do is actually just kind of stop and be in his presence and give him our attention and devotion. So that's something um, that we're doing as well. And all of these things are really just to prepare our hearts for celebrating Easter and celebrate uh, the resurrection. And as we do that, we really look to uh, recognize our need for a savior, our need to repent of our sin, and then also be able to celebrate the mercy and love of our God. So look forward to doing that together as well. Another thing we have coming up is our Inked Outreach event, Inked Stories That Stick. That's going to be on Saturday, March 18th, also down the road at Vassa Park, another location. Surprise. Um, <laughs> so if you're interested in serving or participating in that event, go to commonplacechurch.org slash overflow for more info. Yeah, I think we also have a sign-up sheet in the lobby and as well. And little cards. Little cards that are printed out. And little flyers and invitations. Yeah. You can see Donna. Donna knows all things Inked. Yeah. Thank so, you, Donna. Aside from that, there are the other ways that we respond to the gospel here at Commonplace weekly. Yes, one of those ways is serving. Now, we give the same shtick every week about serving. And so we decided what we would do is we would take each week to just highlight one of the ministries that we have here, some of the needs, and really some of the ways we see God working in those ministries. Uh, so this week, we just want to take a minute to talk about Commonplace Kids. That's our kids' ministry. That is our nursery. That is both classrooms, ages, I believe, four to six and seven through nine. Um, and each and every week we have a nursery program available. We have two classrooms available teaching the students um, so that we can disciple those age groups. And then we can also have parents that can focus during church. So it helps everybody. It serves everyone. Um, as far as that ministry goes, we do have multiple different needs. Uh, we always have needs in that. There's the check-in station. You guys probably see that when you come in. Uh, we need folks who can help uh, serve there, just greet people, sign people up. If it's a new family, getting them signed up. Uh, we need teachers for uh, both age groups. Uh, the nursery could always use more volunteers in there as well. And then also potentially somebody to help just schedule week to week um, all of those ministries. And, um, you know, church center planning services, you guys are mostly familiar with those apps. Uh, that's what we use to schedule people week to week. We could definitely use a hand as a church in scheduling some of those ministries out. So if maybe you're not as um, much of maybe a teacher, but more of an administrative side, and you have a gifting in that area to help in that way, um, that would be a huge help behind the scenes as well. Um, and one of the really cool things that Commonplace Kids does is it really connects us all um, as a church family, all generations, all ages, all coming together for the same purpose, uh, to learn more about Jesus. Um, so we're really excited that we get to have this program each and every week. Sue does a great job getting the curriculum ready each and every week. And so many of you teachers who I know invest so much of your time prepping for the lessons, teaching, um, disciplining other people's kids, and you get the idea. Uh, so really, we're just grateful for everyone who serves in that area. And if that's something that um, in any way sounds interesting or appealing to you, uh, please let us know. You can sign up at commonplacechurch.org slash kids and learn more there as well. Yes. So yes. We, we also respond to the gospel. Transition. Through giving. So if you call Commonplace Church your home, you know that we have the option to give online or the black box in the back. And if you're just visiting... Um, we're just glad that you're here. We do have connect cards on the black box that we'd love for you to fill out. Let us know how we could be praying for you and just to get to know more about you. So, yeah. 
Absolutely. One other way that we respond to the gospel every week is just through teaching the Bible. Like we said, we do in the kids' uh, classrooms every week, and we do um, here in church as well. And this week we're continuing our study through the book of Ecclesiastes as Kirk brings us through the rest of chapter 2. If you don't own a Bible, uh, we have Bibles in the lobby as well. If you don't have one or own one, like I said, please consider that our free gift to you. Oh, the next one's me. The reason we gather is because of the gospel. That's the big one. That's like the one that really matters. So if you weren't listening this whole time, totally forgiven. This is a good time to tune in. We gather each and every week because of the good news that God loves us, and he designed us for a relationship with him. And although our sin separates us from God, right, that the decisions that we've made both willfully and out of ignorance really separate us from the God of the universe. So he did something about that because he loves us and cares about us so much. And so what he did is he sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to live a perfect life, a sinless life, and to go to a cross and to die for the sins of humanity. But not only that, but to raise from the dead victorious over sin and over death, that when we would turn to God and when we would turn and receive Jesus as our Lord and our Savior and repent of our sin, we're actually given the forgiveness of sin that Jesus bought, that Jesus earned, that Jesus had on our behalf on the cross. And by doing that, we're reconciled back to the God of the universe. So the one who created us, who we've been separated from, we are now reconciled back to. We can have a relationship with the God of the universe. We can know him as our heavenly father, and we can live lives of meaning and purpose. And we'll talk about a lot in Ecclesiastes. What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? Why are we here? Why bother? And the good news of the gospel is that we do all have meaning and purpose and reason for being alive and reason for being here today. And so we get to celebrate that truth together, and then we get to go out into our communities, our workplaces, our schools, and share that good news with other people as well. Uh, So that's why we're here, and by God's grace, that's the only reason we'll ever gather. Um, At this time, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our kids' ministry, and just look at all those smiling faces and tell me you don't want to serve back there. These kids are just bundles of joy, I promise. Thanks for being here. Good morning, everybody. My my name is Eric. I may be familiar to some of you uh, because I'm part of the uh, greeting team at the front door. Anyway, I'm very happy to be here this morning. Uh, It's my privilege to read Ecclesiastes 2, 18 through 26, The Vanity of Toil. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This is also vanity. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This is also vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him... Who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. All right, good morning, Commonplace Church. How's everybody doing? 
All right, good. Good to be with you guys. Uh, my name is Kirk, one of the pastors here. If you are visiting with us, as we share, as Eric just uh, read for us, we are in this book of Ecclesiastes. It's an Old Testament book that we've been really encouraged by because it's such an encouraging book. It, it actually really is. But uh, we are going to talk today about something everyone loves talking about on the weekends, especially uh, where we live, right? We're going to talk about work. Woo! Let's talk about work on Sunday, fun day. I'm sure you guys are super pumped to hear about work, especially in church, right? That's just a little bit of a a bonus for you there. But the reason we're talking about work is because, well, first and foremost, the way we teach through the Bible here is we look at the passage and we say, all right, what is God trying to share with us? That's how the Bible works, trying to speak life. And today, the passage is there. It's about work. So that's one reason we're actually talking about work on a Sunday. And, and the second reason that we're going to talk about work on a Sunday, um, really, as I was working this week, working through just preparing this message, I was struck with a really powerful quote and kind of the realization that maybe, maybe it's not so bad to talk about work on, on a Sunday morning. Maybe, maybe we actually don't talk about it enough on a Sunday, or even throughout our time as a church. And this quote's from a a lady named uh, Dorothy Sales, and she wrote this essay a few years ago uh, regarding church and work. And so I want to share a little bit with you guys about this quote and just maybe just share why it kind of convicted me a little bit. So it says this. It says, In nothing has the church so lost her hold on reality as in her failure to understand and respect the secular vocation. She has allowed work and religion to become separate departments and is astonished to find that, as a result, the secular work of the world is turned to purely selfish and destructive ends and that the greater part of the world's intelligent workers have become irreligious or at least uninterested in religion. She asks, but is it astonishing? How can anyone remain interested in a religion which seems to have no concern with nine-tenths of his life? So that's an interesting quote. Um, It it doesn't mean that every Sunday from now on, every message, we're going to talk about work. The the gospel is still primary. It's still what we talk about every week. But what I was convicted by was, well, how often do we as a church find opportunities to speak the gospel into the nine-tenths of how we spend our lives? The nine-tenths that we put our lives devoted to. And so my hope today is through Solomon's teaching— through just scripture support, is is I'd love to share with you guys how the gospel, just a little foundation of how the gospel frames work, this gospel framework. But I think in order to do that, we have to start with a little bit of of a question, a question just to ask ourselves today. And and here's the question. Well, how do I currently frame work in my life? How do I currently frame it? Like, what's my current, we're going to use a lot, framework, how do I place the construct of work in my life? How does that look? Where do I place that? What value do I give this nine-tenths? Okay, I know there's, there's students in here, okay? And so you're probably like already checked out because we're talking about work, all right? I, I hear you guys. I see you guys. But let me just encourage you. The reason you go to school because they want you to go to work one day, all right? That's the pathway towards work. You're going to join the workforce. So I think... I know you might want to tune out, I get it, but just bear with me, because I think the gospel framework for work is important no matter where you are, whether you're a student, because you know that's what you're preparing to do, go to work, or, or if you've been working for a while, or even if you've worked and you're done in that season, I just think this is, this is important. So just, just wanted to point that out before we go forward, but here's the big question, here's our big takeaway, our, our question for today to wrestle with, is how do I place or frame whatever you want to say, the value of work in my life? Simply, how do I place work? And yes, I know there's some corniness factors going on with framework, workplace, place work. I get it. Like, I'm, I'm taking that risk today. But as, as we think of this question, as I reflect on the story of my life, how, how have I placed work? How have I placed it? And the good news is I'm going to help us out a little bit today. I'm going to give us a few. We're going to do some multiple choice, so we don't have to do any extra work. I'm going to give us a few choices and there, it's going to be A through C. There's no D, like all the above. I know that's like a, a favorite one that I usually choose. I'm like, I just got to be all of them, right? But I do want to share there's a little bit in the A through C. There's a little bit of nuance. I'm going to say there's a little bit of nuance in that and some potential for overlap. overlap. But, but here's the three categories I'm going to give us, 
All right, here's the three places where we might be placing work. And here's the first one. First category is work framed as gain. And, and listen, this might be nuanced because the whole concept of work is that we're compensated, right? That we're actually uh, gaining something. That's the associated of work. But I want to dig a little bit deeper into this idea of what I mean by gain. So just digging a little further with gain. Gain I'm referring to, and what we're going to see Solomon talk about throughout this this passage, recognizes it's just above, more. it's further past compensation. It's the earthly rewards. It's it's the the, the fancy treasures. It's the the nest egg. It's the creature comforts. It's the opportunities to to be in charge, to be the best in your industry, to be the boss. That's kind of more what I'm getting at when it comes to work that's framed as gain. Okay, work as gain. It's earthly rewards. First category. Second category is this. It's grind. It's grind. Work framed as this grind, just as this obligation. And so here's what I mean. Basically, it's just something we have to do because that's how our society works. And if I want to fit to the societal code, I just have to do this. I have to show up and just play my role, do my part. But you might do that. You might show up and accomplish your task. But you might work in this posture that's familiar to um, the great Peter Gibbons from Office Space fame when he says this. He says, we don't have a lot of time in this earth. We weren't meant to spend it this way. Human beings were not meant to sit in little cubicles staring at computer screens all day, filling out useless forms, listening to eight different bosses drone on about mission statements. The great Peter Gibbons. So that's the second category. Here's the third one. Third one is work framed as gift. Work framed as gift. And that might be the, the category that might be, I would say, most scoffed at. Like, But that's actually the gospel frame for work. That's how the gospel frames work. The gospel frame is, it is a gift. And and so I'll just be honest, my my New Jersey kind of like cynicism, like when I hear that one, I'm already like, work work is a gift? Like that's, I I don't, you know, I don't see it. So if if you're feeling that, like I, I get it, okay? But here's an important realization for us today as we look at how we frame work. When it comes to answering this question of determining our framework, whether what, what is it, or if we're looking to build a gospel framework, here's, here's, the, here's just something to think about. How we frame our work determines how we engage our work. Simply this, our framework, well, it frames work. And here, here's what I want us to take away just, just to be reminded of today, when it comes to framing our work, when it comes to the gospel, you see, the gospel frames work as a gift to be received, not a gain to be achieved, or some sort of obligation that, that we, we perceive. So that, that's, that's, that's what we're taking away today. It's this gift that we receive. Work, a gift, right? It's a gift, Yes, that thing that you're despising to go to tomorrow, many of you, right? I, I, I recognize this work gifting. This might be a challenging frame to, to, to receive. And so if, if that's the case, if you're feeling that, well, how in the world do we get to this place where we see work as a gift received? And, and I'll, I'll be honest, it's, it's a complicated conversation. It's, it's complex Because some of us, right, gift, it might be challenging because you find your work to be dreadful. It's just awful, right? Work stinks. Like, good luck trying to convince me otherwise that work is a gift. That might might be one group. But then, on the contrary, there might be a group that maybe says, well, I, you know, maybe my job is a gift. Like, agreed. That's that's what it is. What's next? Thanks for your teaching today, right? And, And if that's you... Well, let me just say, not, not so fast. Um, you might love your job. That's, that's, that's pro- that could be true. But the question is, well, would we love it if, if the conditions maybe shift a little bit? 
Like if there was nothing but living wages, if that's, that's all was to gain, like there's no opportunity for additional uh, gain, like there's nothing there. And so, so my challenge, I guess, for, for those who maybe are saying, hey, I love your job, well, let's, let's pull back the layers a little bit. Let's pull back the layers and let's dig, I would say, into to, to the motives of why we work and then, then sincerely ask, well, do I love my job because I actually see it as a gift or because I find in it these, these gains? And, and here's how we, we might be able to determine that, that, dis, that discrepancy. Let's say we had the chance to have this old, good old time machine and time machine it up like Marty McFly and just kind of go to the future here. And we're looking into the future. We're able to give that and find out one day when we no longer can work that all that we've worked for, all we've accomplished, everything we've built, everything we've achieved, all the treasures, if all those gains will have to be given away to someone, someone else, someone who just shows up and takes all of them from us, and then they just squandered, squandered them all away, just, just gone. Like, would that foreknowledge, if you were able to know that, would that impact the, the adoration of your work or even just your, your, your work ethic? Would it have an impact? Like, if there was no goal to be achieved, no notoriety, no recognition, does that shift your frame? Does that shift your view of work? Is it still a gift? I mean, it's, it's possible, but, it, but it's probably not as, as likely and so how do we move towards this gospel view, this gospel frame of work as a gift? It's, it's, it's not easy, but it's possible. It's absolutely possible. And, and I'm saying it's not easy because every time I say work as a gift, no one is saying amen. All right? No one is saying amen. So I'm considering that this might not be an easy thing. Even myself, I, I feel, I'm feeling like cringy saying work is a gift. It feels a little cringy because I've had jobs that I would say, I wasn't like, this is a great gift. Uh, I worked at the grocery store back in, when I was a teenager, the old a and I don't think those exist anymore. But I remember watching um, the lady with the cart overflowing, change purse out, checkbook, coupons. I was like, wow, look at that gift. Like, that, that wasn't happening, right? I worked at a, um, a summer camp. And I think that year they abolished the child labor laws. I think they just got rid of them. And it was like 100 hours a week that I had to scrub dishes. And I was like, what a gift this is, right? E- even um, later on, when my wife and I, we got married, our first jobs were in customer service. We took calls, took about 150 calls every day. And these individuals were not calling to tell us how amazing our company was or how amazing we were. And so, yeah, that was not really like a time of thank you for that gift of work, right? And, and so some, some might hear today say, thank you. Yeah, I, I, tell me more about this gift. Tell me more of the gift that you're, you're talking about, right? Like the role of, of just trying to homeschool these kids, prepare a meal, Attempting to not see the, the house like blow up, right? Please tell me more about the gift. Or for just working all day, coming home, trying to prepare some meals, trying to not see the house blow up. Like, tell me more about this great gift of work. I get it. And, and so work at times, if we're honest, yes, it can be grueling. And we might have this association of this work as a gift that might bring some pushback. I, to, I, I get that. And, and it's true. Work can feel at times arduous. Solomon actually uses the word toil. He's pretty clear. He's like, toil. And so I, I want to recognize that, that, yes, this gift, the terminology that I'm using, it can be a tough term for us to, to accept when it comes to work. But, but here's what, what I want to offer. Just because there's a tension, because this gift feels a little bit like, like, a, like a drain, right? Well, that doesn't mean that gift is an inaccurate description or definition. So that toil, it doesn't renounce the reality of gift. What does that mean? Well, we'll Genesis 1, two, uh, 1 and 2, we see 
God declaring creation, something really important. It's, it's work as a gift. Genesis 131 says this. It says, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So it's very good, right? So everything he made is very good. And then Genesis 2.15 says, the Lord took the man, and he put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. So according to God, as we look at Scripture, as we look at this biblical narrative, yes, work is a gift from God. It's given to man. God gives this world, he brings life into this world, he creates, and he decrees his creation as very good, and that's really important, because that includes man. Very good includes man, and that gift that he gives man, for man, is to, to care for the creation, to cultivate the creation. And listen, I, I get it, some, some of you are like, cool story, bro, like, but, but it, well, if I'm honest, like, the 40 hours of answering emails, awkward Zoom meetings, TPS reports, KPI performances, like this just doesn't feel like a gift. It doesn't feel like a gift. It feels draining. And that's a valid response. But here's what I love so much about the Bible, so much about the gospel, is that in this disconnect, in this tension that we might feel, when we, this gift that might feel kind of brutal will the Bible actually gives us an answer for this tension. Actually tells us what what we're feeling. Genesis 3 says this, one chapter later, Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. So the, the answer that the Bible gives us is what's recognized as what we call the fall of man. It's, it's this curse upon the, the earth. Where creation as we know it, has now become, it's, it's become sin marred. It's become marked by sin. So this good soil now turns to things like these thoils, these thorns and thistles that we have. And so part of how the gospel frames work is this recognition that yes, it is a gift. But part of how the gospel frames work also acknowledges the reality of sin's impact on creation. Sin's impact on this gift from God. Just like the gospel acknowledges sin's impact on all other different gifts as well. The same things with the gift of work, right? Things like food or or drink or or sex or, or pleasure. Like sin's impact is felt on those things and it's felt on those gifts and this gift of work as well. See, sinful man can so easily take any one of God's intended good gifts and just mess it up. And just misuse it, just abuse it. And when it comes to work, honestly, we don't have to look too far in the history of our country to kind of see that play out. Right? We had to come up with labor laws. The, the, the reality is there was, there was slavery that happened in this country, right? Work was abused, it was misused. In fact, some, some people look at it as it, work became violent. It was an act of violence, I, I, I uh, stumbled upon a quote by a guy who has the coolest name I've ever heard of. His name is Studs Terkel, all right? Find me a better name than Studs Terkel. Some of you guys are want to change your name right now. It's Studs Terkel. I do too. But Studs Terkel, he, he did this interview where he wrote this book, and he interviewed all these different people about their jobs, about their occupations. And he just he wrote down all his data, and then he just came up with this report. And here's what, what Studs says about this. He says, this book... Being about work is by its very nature about violence to the spirit as well as to the body. It's about ulcers as well as accidents, about shouting matches as well as fistfights. It's about nervous breakdowns as well as kicking the dog around at home after the long day. It is above all or beneath all about daily humiliations. To survive the day is triumph enough for the walking wounded among the great many of us. That's pretty good. Calculation there from our guy Studs, right? Studs does a really good job there of work that's been marred by sin. And, and, and it it's helps us to understand how the gospel frames work. Because the gospel doesn't tell us to deny toil. Right? It doesn't tell us to walk being naive towards the, the thistles. See, the gospel, and I love this, it frames work by helping us place that tension. It gives us a place for that tension. And along with the placement of that tension, the gospel, it frames work with a new intention. And this new intention is incredible. It's it's redemption. It's redemption. Because that's what the gospel narrative reminds us, that it doesn't end at the fall. The gospel message doesn't, doesn't stop at the fall. It concludes with redemption. 
It concludes with restoration of all things. That means work. And we can work with then this reframed understanding because we have redemption. Meaning that even in the most challenging of jobs, and some of you have some challenges, I get that, we can find moments. We can see glimpses of the original gift. We can see glimpses of God's work, of his redemptive work through what Christ has done. Through Christ, work. Work can it actually be framed as a gift once more. It's this gift that's redeemed. It's a gift that can be restored. How, how do we see this happen? Well, the joy of following Jesus is that God, through Christ Jesus, is in this process of redeeming and restoring all things. All things, that's including work. We actually see in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 10, we have this incredible uh, view. And I love the placement of this verse. Because it it comes at the end of of, of verse 1 and 9, which talks about God. He's restoring humanity. He's taking what was once dead in sin, now brings it alive and giving it new life. And he talks about at the end of this, Paul talks about at the end, he says, this is who God is. He's this redeemer. He's redeeming all things, all things including work. And through the gospel, we see this, his people to do what? It says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, prepared before him that we should walk in them. So what does he call us to do? Redemption means we go out. We go out and be his workmanship for these good works. So work is a gift. It's work that's redeemed, becomes these opportunities to talk about the Redeemer, to point to the Redeemer, because that's, once again, that's who God is. And and this is what the gospel frame of work looks like. The gospel frames work as this gift to receive. It's it's not a gain to be achieved or this obligation that we perceive. All right, so... It's possible that some may still hear this and say, yeah, I understand the redemption thing, but I still don't think as I look at the work ahead of me, the work week ahead of me, that I'm pumped about the gift thing, all right? And, and, and that's fair. If, if that's where you're at, that's totally fine. And, and, and so maybe work becomes more of a little bit of a gift if, if there's some more perspective that I can offer uh, just to, to keep going for, further in this little bit, this where we see gift become more uh, recognizable. And so here's, here's how I see it happening. It's when we play out these other options. Right, so we play out this option of work as gain and, and work as this grind, this obligation. So let's look at the first option. Let's look at this option of work framed as gain. And I want to um, recognize and explore the question of, well, what's the difference between gift and between gain? What's the difference between gift and gain? Well, well, what is a gift? What is is a gift? I I would probably answer somewhat this. I I propose a gift is something that we would receive, something we receive. And if so, then gain is, is what? Well, my thought it's something we, we might perceive that we've actually achieved, okay? And, and there's probably nuance in this. I get that. But, but when I think of gift, I, I think of something that we can hold loosely. Something we can hold loosely, we can appreciate, because it wasn't something of our own. It wasn't something that, it was, it wasn't something that we, we've, we've gained. It's something that was given to us. And yes, a gift has value, but it was never ours in the first place. And so if it's no longer ours, well, if we lose that gift, there might be an impact. I agree with that. But it, but it shouldn't destroy us. It wasn't ours. Now let's take gain. Gain, I'd say it lends to something that we, we cling to a little bit more because we've had this impression that somehow, somehow we've achieved it. Like, that's mine. Don't touch it. Like, like, a, like a group of, um, of toddlers hanging out, playing with their toys. Like, and, and one tries to kind of take one from the other one, and I had it first. And, and like, well, what happens? No, that's mine. And then we have these temper tantrums taking place. Like, and I don't want to play with this anyway. Like, that, that's, that's kind of what we look at. And, and I'm not equating the working world to a bunch of toddlers. Um, but, but what I am, I'm making the connection to uh, the view of work that simply is viewed for the gains, 
for the money, for the treasure, for the possessions, for the different uh, statuses, being the boss, right? The danger is we look at, at, at work in those view with that rewards, like that, that, yes, those things may come from our labor, but the dangers we can start to try to acknowledge and believe that those rewards are something that we've actually achieved rather than the reality. They're just gifts that we've received. And, and, and some might argue, no, I've, I've gained those items. I've achieved that promotion. I've worked hard. I busted my hump for these. But, but let's ask, well, did we all on our own without any help, any handouts, any gifts? Like, can we really say with 100% honesty that we've achieved any of those accomplishments, possessions on our own without the dependence of another? Can we say that? We can say Yes, these are my achievements. And, and yes, I agree, you might have worked hard for those, to get into the position to acquire those things. I get that. But without the gift of life, without the gift of intelligence, without the gifts that were given to you by someone else who created you, well, the honest truth is we're not acquiring those possessions. That position without gifts, talents that were given to us. It's, it's, it's really tough to, to, to argue with that. But if we frame work from this beauty of the gospel, of this gospel lens that says gift, well, it puts us in this position that says we're all dependents. I mean, God, God can claim each one of us on his taxes. Like, because we've been designed by an intelligent designer who's given us gifts. He's given us talents. He's given us abilities. It's what James shares in chapter 117. He says, he says, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. He's the giver of all gifts. He gives all of our gifts, including work. And here, here's the joy of how the gospel frames work. Well, it humbles us, and it allows us to work not for gain, but, but actually from it. Not for gain, but from it. To see work as this actual gift from God, and then as a gift that we can use for others. And, and here's what Solomon's, he's going to recognize in this passage. As we, as we look in this passage, he, that work as a gift, what it also does, it also allows us to hand over whatever might come from the labor of our hands, these rewards of power, prestige, possession. It allows us to hand that over with a peace and not with a panic. See, see someone is going to share the rewards that we've put our hands to, right? And, and it, these, these, these gains, someone is going to share those gains. And if gains are a framework for work, he, here's, here's a harsh truth. One day those gains are just going to be given away. They're going to be given away. Sadly, the, 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 for gains, what happens is we often just cling so much to something that will one day vanish. Even worse, something that could be given to someone who did absolutely nothing to deserve it. And Solomon adds something even important. He says, well, who knows if they'll be wise or just going to be a complete moron. Look what he says. He says, I hated all the toil in which I toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to a man who will come after me. And who knows if he will be wise or a fool. He's like, I hated work. That's pretty harsh. It sounds like Solomon has a case of the Mondays, but that's not really what's going on. He's not upset about having to work. He's not upset about having to go in on a, on a Saturday. It's his hatred is for what happens to his gains. That's what he's upset about, right? After all the things he's, he's, he's now, let's see, he's gone 
gone public. He's Fortune 500. He's like reveling, reveling in all of his gains, only to make this realization that as he passes from the wor- this world, well, someone else is just going to come in and take over all that he's worked so hard for, all of his accomplishments. And, well, what happens if they're an idiot? Like, what, what happens if that's the case? What if, what if they're just these, these dummies are inheriting what he's gained? And, and I love this. Is, this fits into what Solomon says as well, that there's nothing new under the sun. Because we see this concept happen all over. You remember the, the 90s movies that, like, uh, Tommy Boy or Billy Madison, right, where it's like the, the rich father has to give all his, his earnings to the, the, the idiot son. Like, I mean, Sandler and Farley should thank the Bible for that storyline. That's totally taken from there. But, but the question Solomon is going to ask and have us to kind of work through, and maybe this is a good question to ask ourselves, is was working or is working hard for these gains? Is it worth it? Right? All the time that is away, that I take away to, to put towards this, this, this job, this occupation. Whoa. Yeah. Energy. Brain power. Wisdom. All these things. Right? Was it worth it? Is it worth it knowing that one day it's going to be handed down? It's going to be given to someone else. I have to hand over the reins. And is it worth it knowing that this person might even just be an idiot? So... How we frame work, gift, or, or do we frame it? Do we frame it as gain? And, and, and now listen, I want to be honest. Not, not every, um, every, everything handed down is going to be to an idiot, okay? There's probably one in your family tree, but I don't know where. And, but it, that's not always the case in every situation, right? But here's the crazy thing. If you're familiar with Solomon's story, that's exactly what happens to him. It is. So homework for this week, uh, check out 1 Kings uh, chapter 12. It's the story of Rehoboam and, and Solomon's son, okay? So this actually happens to him. And, and, and I, listen, I, I understand that most uh, people here are not kings, so we, we might not uh, fit what Solomon's kind of talking about in some way, right? But there still is a principle that I think it's important that we, we, we look at because we're all going to be passing along something, and for some, there's, there's a lot that could be passed along. I, I get that, some certain inheritances. But what we have come to realize here in this culture is we, we kind of just work to build these, like, personal kingdoms. These personal, just uh, royal palaces and places that we're going to pass down. And the reality is, as we're building these personal kingdoms, th- these castles, if we frame work as some sort of, like, achieved, gained it's, it's honestly like we're building these castles, not out of bricks, not out of stones, but these, these, are, these are castles that are made out of sand. They're castles made in sand. It's, like, it's, it's really, we, we've somehow convinced ourselves that we need to build this big castle. And whoever has the biggest castle here around, uh, well, really, what you're really winning is kind of the equivalent of like first place in a, in a sand castle building contest because it's all going to be gone. I, I personally have a love-hate relationship with the sandcastle thing. Um, I, I love when my kids ask to build a sandcastle. I think that's really cool, and I appreciate that. But then I, I hate when, like, we've spent all this time building. This whole building project comes together. I got all the permits, everything, right? And, and then we, t- we cut the ribbon, and all of a sudden, like, we're about to christen the castle, and then some teenager runs around and, like, steps on our castle and, like, ruins the whole thing, catching a frisbee or football. Or when we're, like, really into it and we lose track of time, and then all of a sudden it's high tide, and we're like, run for your lives. <laughs> like, this whole thing's going to be destroyed. Like, it, it's, there's a love part of, like, being part of doing that with my kids, but then this hate part of because it's tears now. It's results like, why... Why, why did the structure that we spent so many hours building, dedicating our time to, why is it gone? Why is it not recognizable? And not just tears, but then for me, it's just like anger, right? I'm like all mad at the teenagers being teenagers and stepping on my castle. Like, what's wrong with you? Or, or just like, you know, fist in the air towards creation, towards the ocean. Like, I'll get you, ocean, for what you're doing. Like, but but that, that's just the results of when we see work as gain, and not as gift. Now, now what if I reframed my sandcastle theology a little bit, right? What if I reframed it towards gift? Like if the goal isn't just gain, 
of these accomplishments, of this structure, but rather it's just a gift. I've been given the gift of enjoying time with my kids. I've been given the gift of enjoying creation, the beauty of creation. And so, so here's what I think we just need to contemplate a little bit. Have I, have I framed my work as just some means for earthly gain? And, and yes, of course, we're, we recognize that compensation is part of the whole way that the process of employment works. I get that. But have I framed work with the purpose of gain of just treasures, status, identity? And, and, and if I have, let's ask, am I prepared for the day when all that I've labored for, all these hours that I've given to, those gains will be left in pieces? like that castle in the sand with just the the recollection of the efforts only to remain. And and if that's unsettling to you, like like it is for Solomon, here's the the good news we we need to be reminded of. The, The gospel, right? The gospel frames work as a gift, not as this gain. It's this gift to be received, not this gain to be just achieved. And and here's what I what I love about the gospel, we understand the greatest gift that we will ever be receiving in our lives is this gift of salvation, this gift of reconciliation, of, of restored relationship with God the Father. It, it, this, it's just a gift that we did not accomplish. We didn't do anything to, to deserve it, but it's just given to us. When we understand that, we understand that we have this eternal treasure, this eternal gift of Christ's work on the cross gifted to us. Well, we, we can then walk in this freedom towards these other gifts or these other gains that we see in this world. And we don't have to work to just obtain or gain rewards that are just fleeting, these treasures of this world. We rather, we can proclaim through this work, this gift of what Christ has done, we can proclaim that to others in this world. But so here's the question. How do we frame work? Is it this gift is it this gain? Je- Jesus gives us this parable. It's a powerful teaching that we see in Luke chapter 12 when we place work just as gain. It says this, And he told him a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he, said, he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store up all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for me for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. So Jesus gives us this really powerful message, and just reality that our, our, our time is limited. We never know. And, and so if we frame this gospel understanding of work as this gift, we're able to walk in a peace. And, and, and we, we don't have to look at it as something we, we have to achieve, or the last one is this obligation that we, we perceive. So let's just close with this last piece where work is placed. It's this grind. It's this obligation. Look what he says in Ecclesiastes 2, 22, 23. For what has a man from all the toil and striving his heart, which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow. His work is vexation. Even the night his heart does not rest. This is also vanity. So here's what the work as an obligation. Here's this example of work without purpose. Just something we're just supposed to do because that's how the world works and how we contribute to society. And because this lack of, of purpose and meaning, well, it just feels like a grind. Just grinding away, asking, what's the point? Does any of this even matter? And so, I don't know, let's, has, has anyone, anyone ever felt that? Anyone feeling that even at this moment? Um, well, Here's kind of just another reminder of uh, finding ourselves in that position. What a uh, current pop culture, not current, but a pop culture thing. My boy Peter Gibbons says, so I was sitting in my cubicle today and I realized ever since I started working, 
Every single day of my life has been worse than the day before. So that means every single day that you see me, that's on the worst day of my life, right? So may, maybe you're feeling that right now. I know if I've felt that in my working tenure. But Solomon places, he's this grind, he's, it's this vexation, right? Those, those days, they're just full of sorrow. Those nights, they're restless because we're thinking, well, what in the world are we even doing? What's the point? Well, I'm just staying awake to do what? And so if that's you, listen, I don't want to add to your vexation or your restlessness by just kind of saying, well, go find your purpose. Or like, just stop showing out of work, out of ob- like obligation. Just quit your job and be happy. Like, I, I, I kind of think the unemployment will, will, take, uh, will not take away those sleepless nights. All right? That's just kind of what I'm thinking. But, but I do think I want to offer a little bit of a helpful um, truth and a little bit of a, a close our time just a call to action. And so the truth is just the tr- truth from Scripture. And, and the call to action, I think, is probably more for us as, as a church um, a collective. But here's the truth from God's word. It's from Colossians. And I, and I pray it's an encouragement. It says this. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. And so, so that's, that's this truth that we have from the word of God. So whatever God is calling us to do, because we're serving Christ, we have purpose. We have purpose. We're not working for Bill Lumberg, Miranda Priestley, Mr. Spacely, whoever. We're working for the Lord Jesus, which frames our work as a gift. It's not a grind. And so what, what does it look like to work as this act of service for Christ? Right? Rather than just to show up, what does it look like to serve, to work as we serve Christ? Okay, so here, here's the, the call to action to finish up our time as a church family. What would it look like to just remind one another that work for the disciple of Jesus, right? For each one of us here follows Jesus. It isn't just some obligatory act, but it's an opportunity to place work from a purpose and, and not for a purpose. So from a purpose and not for a purpose. Right? How, how, as a church family, might we be able to just encourage each other to labor well? Right? Not, not out of judgment, but just to labor, to encourage to labor with this purpose of reflection of a disciple of Christ. I want to reference this Dorothy Sayers essay one, one, once more because I think there's something of value we can draw out from this, uh, this essay. It says this, The church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him to not be a drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and come to church on Sundays. What the church should be telling him is this, that the very first demand his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. Now, Sayers, what she's not saying is we should hold off on addressing sin or repentance, confession. She's not saying that, salvation. But what she's saying to the church is that we have this opportunity as a group of believers to share the gospel message, this good news of grace, and how that engages not just a portion of our life, but throughout our whole life. How it provides purpose for us in life as a whole, including that nine-tenths of it. The nine-tenths engaging in this gift of work, which, when it's framed as a gift, it actually does provide purpose. And so, so I, I, I wonder like, what, what it might look like for us just to take some time, engage and encourage one another, not just on Sunday morning, but throughout the week. Encourage each other. Check in. How's the nine-tenths going? Right? And listen, if you're in a season where maybe you uh, are unable, unable to work or between jobs or uh, retired, like your role, you might be the ones who are going to be leading the charge in this for us. You might be pushing us forward in this. Maybe that time you have, maybe that's to encourage others. Because here's the thing, the gospel, it's not just the Sunday morning conversation and we're done. Right? What, what Christ has done for humanity is it's not just recognized from 10 to 11 on a Sunday morning in a middle school, right? But, but what, right, what Christ has done is calling, he's calling us into this kingdom, which is everlasting, where we're going to labor both now and forever for his glory, for our joy, and for the good of others. So 
honestly, my hope is just let's take some time today, even just after service, check in on one another. How's that nine-tenths going? Right? Maybe we don't always have to keep shop talk in the shop. Maybe we can actually speak the gospel into those moments where we're just sharing what the majority of our time spent throughout the week actually looks like. So just maybe we can encourage each other. Find some time today, this week, and encourage each other as how the gospel frames work as this gift. Why don't don't we pray? Father, we thank you that uh, you didn't just place us here to just sit and just wait and do nothing, Lord, but you've actually uh, gifted us the opportunity to represent you, Lord, to reflect you, Lord, to point to the kingdom, to speak of the truth of the gospel, what it means to work and to labor, Lord, for your glory, God. I pray, Lord, as a church, we would come together and just recognize the need to just encourage one another, to to, to check in, to just really be present, whether it's just to hear someone share struggles at work, whether to hear opportunities at work, Lord, whatever it might be, Lord, I pray that you would help us see and frame work through the lens of the gospel. And we'd be able to see work as this gift. Lord, I, I pray that you would give us a clear understanding of, of if we're working just for gains, Lord, of just how fleeting that can be and how that's just temporal. And that these things that we might be seeking after, Lord, yes, there's, there's joy in those, but they're just not eternal They're not everlasting. One day they're going to be taken or we have to give them to someone else, Lord. Maybe an idiot. We don't know. But God, we know that you, Lord, call us to see work differently. To see it as this gift. And I pray for those maybe finding it as this grind. Lord, recognize that. I pray that you bring purpose. Lord, bring purpose. And just even the small things, Lord, that these are opportunities, God, to point to you. We thank you for the gospel. The gospel gives us hope. Lord, the gospel gives us peace. And Lord, the gospel, what Christ has done, gives us joy. And I pray that we would walk in that today. Pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship. If every effort brought another sleepless night I'd be so tired I have strived enough to know that this divide Could never be repaired through countless second tries Still I stay the course, avoiding what is right Now I'm so tired I'm just so tired I relent There is nothing for me here You can have it all this life is not my own You give life That is worth the loss of mine I surrender all I have to follow you Trade and cherish truth for worthless lies Raging through the earth for treasure I couldn't find 
Wallowed in the mud for nothing but my pride And I am so tired I'm just so tired Just want to live in peace But I'm struggling to believe That letting go will give me peace Can I sit here at your feet This is right where I belong I can feel it in my soul You say I'm right where I belong Sing that out, I know that I belong And I know that I
pray. Um, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for this message, um, even this reminder, if you will, Lord, uh, that work is a gift from you. And um, as we go out and work our jobs, Lord, is meaningless at times or um, pointless that it may seem. Um, we have purpose. We serve a purpose regardless of what we do. Um, this world is a better place because of the gifts you've given us and the work you've uh, set a in front of us to do, Lord. So as we go out, allow us to have the heart of the Father and recognize that it is a gift and that um, if we work our jobs every day for your glory, this world will be a better place, Lord, through your people. We thank you, Lord, allow us to do these things for just uh, your glory, others' good, and our joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, yeah, we have a prayer team also. If you uh, need some prayer today, come on down. Happy Sunday. No.